Than the yeah. rest. Okay. Now, with the streaming, do you want me in a you know, particular you spot? Yeah, maybe you. Good morning, everyone. It is my absolute um, privilege to introduce you to Sister Geridet Phillips, RSCJ, from Indonesia. Now, the, I have a strong sense of privilege, but I have a strong sense of responsibility to justify. When I met Geridette and then read a little bit about her, I was so in awe, I thought, oh goodness, I better get this right. So, um, for me, when I think of Geridette, I think of Philippine. And we were talking this morning about crossing frontiers. And in so many ways, she is personifying that in her work and in her life experiences and those sorts of things. And she challenges each one of us to be able to be courageous in terms of crossing our frontiers. So Geridette was born in India. And when she was a young girl, she had three callings that have um, been the basis of all the, uh, her, her achievements in life in terms of her first calling that she was aware of was her interest and desire to be involved with interfaith dialogue. Her second calling was very much to do with special education and making a difference to some of our most uh, vulnerable young uh, children. And the third one, of course, was to have a strong and personal relationship with God. And when you look at her life and the huge difference that she has made and all the work that she has done, those three are relevant at every point all the way through. So for me, when we look at the interfaith dialogue, she has a master's in Islamic philosophy and mysticism. She has a PhD in inter-religious inter dialogue as well. Also, in terms of her special education interest and trying to make a difference with the most vulnerable, she has a master's degree in special education. And when, when we're looking at her third one, she has been an RSCJ for 25 years. So she has celebrated her Silver Jubilee. So she has made a significant contribution there. In terms of crossing frontiers, 
in many ways it's uh, from moving from India where she has a strong relationship with her family, she then moved to Indonesia, leaving behind family, leaving behind things that were f uh, familiar and having to go somewhere where she didn't know or have strong connections, which of course she now does. So um, I think that that was a very courageous and a, and a pioneering move there. For me, um, when I talked to Geraudette today, I said, what is um, important to you? And she said, it's always about peace and bringing peace to others, but being aware that you always struggle with your own peace and that it's always, there's always an inner journey and an inner struggle to ensure that you can find enough peace and enough courage to make a difference with somebody else. And so um, bringing peace to others. And with her work with interreligious or interfaith dialogue, that is personified. Um, she's doing that work every day. So her role currently is um, in leadership and formation in Indonesia as an RSCJ, but also the fact is she also teaches in two universities, one a Muslim university and one a Catholic university. So to me, that is a very clear measure of all the things that she is bringing. Um, and her calls or her vocations that she had as such a young child are so beautifully expressed in the work that she does today. So what I'd like you to do is if you can please welcome Geraudette. Thank you, Christian. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to this um, cold, cold morning outside. But thanks to the organizers, we are warm inside. So I'd like to begin this morning with gathering together all that we have heard since this morning, all our feelings, all our thoughts, all that's happening within us as our opening prayer to the re next one and a half hour that I have the privilege to address with you.
Our topic for today is um, Philippine Duchenne. <coughs> Crossing religious frontiers, discovering a new, the interior life. And so with your own feelings and your own emotions, your own thoughts, in the presence of the Triune God, Sophie and Philippine are two RSEJ saints. We will begin the presentation with Philippines prayer where you will all sing together. This was sung by our young Indonesians. Um, this is Philippines prayer that they put to music. seem to get it working. I'm grateful for this invitation to share with you my passion as an RSCJ. A passion that leads me to want to cross spiritual and religious frontiers in search of world peace as our society has inspired me to do so. The world in which we live today leaves, uh, leaves me, leaves us with a deeper sense of St. Philippine Duchesne's call and the society's first missionary and her challenge to us. She shows us how to allow the spirit to move us to cross new frontiers, both physical and existential. While we are all sitting in this room, and as I talk, at this very moment, we are aware when so many people are prisoners of their own minds, are distant from themselves and others, are caught up in violence, experience division, and where darkness and fear has become part of the collective unconsciousness or collective consciousness, thanks to globalization, I believe that we need to go beyond the phenomenon of globalization 
to find our essential oneness before God. For this, we need to be ready to move beyond our own religious frontiers. And we will see in this presentation how Philippine did this. For almost every one of us, there have been some experiences in life which have never been forgotten. For most of us, these decisive moments make our stories unique. Perhaps few in number, and rare though they may, they may be, they have defined our lives. And they have helped to make us who and what we are. Philippine was no exception. Several times we have read or we have heard the story of in Philippines' life. When on Monday, Thursday, she spent that whole night in prayer. And she called it, O Blessed Night. We can say this was her defining moment. When she sat before the Blessed Sacrament and she gathered up in her prayer all the precious blood from the garden, the praetorium, and Calvary. Holding them, he, she, this is her words, holding them close to my heart, I went forth. And then I found myself alone with Jesus. Alone. Surrounded by dark children. And she goes on and says, I was happier in the midst of my little court than any worldly prince. She writes this in a letter to Sophie on April 4, 1806. And we can say that this letter is the spiritual itinerary of Philippine. What did she do in this night of prayer, in this moment that has defined her life? and through her defining us, she enters her heart, sees herself gather up all the precious blood, finally to realize the identity between the two. What? It is not only to pray, but to become prayer. She held him close to her heart. And if we see the mystics of all religions speak about this, of entering the cave of our hearts. And to quote Rumi, who is a Sufi mystic, Muslim mystic, he says, consider this breast as the cave, the spiritual retreat of the friend. If thou art the companion, enter the cave, enter the cave. Philippine was not just a companion of the cave, but a very close friend of the friend who resided there. And so we can say she lived from three things. To live at the heart center, to experience, and to know all things from that center. She found herself alone with the alone. She held him close to her heart. Her heart now is opened. For what? It, it is opened, becomes the theater for the manifestations of different sacred forms. Did Philippine think of all this at the time? I don't know. But when I look at Philippine, this is how I see her. Who is she for us today? How does she see the world today. Never before has history known so many frontiers in our contemporary world as it is now. And there is in truth only one new experience of real significance. It is the experience of journeying from one religious universe to, the, to another. 
And so I would say, we have, we can, we have seen pictures of Philippine with a map on her lap. Very nice rhyme, yeah? A map on the lap. And if Philippine had to have a map on her lap today, what do you think it would look like? This is how I see it. So as I said earlier, I believe that there is in truth only one new experience of real significance which confronts us more than ever before. One which our parents and ancestors did not face. That experience is not of discovering new continents and planets, not of discovering technology that allows for quicker and better communication, but it is the experience of journeying from one religious universe to another. And the map that you just saw would be our world situation today. One frontier that calls all of us to cross. So crossing religious frontiers, the first part of my address, can be seen in many ways. But I would like to use the scheme used by Harry Olmedo, who edited the journal Crossing Religious Frontiers. He organized it under three headings. And as I said, it's Philippines defining moment, a movement. The first is principles. The second, perspectives. The third is encounters. The principles that are in Philippines' heart, we'll see this later, which is intelligence and will. And we'll see the concept of perennial religion encounters from her perspectives from her heart and I'll talk about perennial wisdom and encounters with her heart. So this is what we will see when we are looking at crossing religious frontiers. All these three shows were Philippine as a woman of the frontier in practically every aspect of her life. 
And before I go on any further, if I am going too fast, please put your hand up. Yeah, because I know I can get very excited now as we are going on. So what are these principles? The things of the world that we see around us does not equal, is not equal to the range of our intelligence and will. Our intelligence and will is far beyond what the world can offer us today. Far beyond. The essential function of the human, of our intelligence is made for the absolute. While our will is made for the real. What is this absolute? What is this intelligence? We are endowed with an intelligence as human beings, with an essential function to discern between what is permanent and what is non-permanent. And this is a human struggle. And the essential function of the will is attachment to the permanent. This discernment and this attachment can be seen in how it epitomizes Philippines spirituality right from her name, Hearts of Oak, to her choices. As a little girl, she was free from pettiness and jealousy. Dolls did not attract Philippine very much. She loved living things and enjoyed reading about real people. She gave her spending money to the poor and when her parents protested saying, we give you that for your pleasure, Philippine said, this is my pleasure. In a tone which the family came to recognize as final. Philippine did not enjoy boisterous games, but was fond of wandering off by herself. She loved to contemplate. So Lynette's call to us this morning, we can see it in Philippine. She loved solitude, not as an escape, but to enjoy her own thoughts and to be with God, who already was taking hold of her life. At the age of 12, she knew what she wanted, and she knew whom she wanted. And she gave herself to God, desire to devote herself to missionary work, which was enkindled in her soul. I was just eight or 10 years, she writes to her cousin. I considered it a great privilege to be a missionary. I envied their labors without being frightened by the dangers to which they were exposed. For I was at this time reading the stories of martyrs in which I was keenly interested. From that time, the world's propagation of the faith and foreign missions and the names of priests destined in them and of religions in faraway lands made my heart thrill. She knew what her heart wanted. She prayed every day for light to know God's will and remained firm in her will for the real. She was God and in love with Christ. When she was 17, a young man was brought home so that she might be settled. She said, the young man was charming and would do. But no, she said, I made up my mind five years ago to be a nun. Much to her surprise, she got away with it. And ever since then, there was no more dancing, no more pretty clothes. She was God's. This for her was her ultimate reality beyond all determination and limitation. She was certainly God's. Philippine was in love with Christ and sure of this divine support. Uh, support. No matter what the trial of her faith may be, she knew this was her life. So what made her brave enough to cross frontiers? And that too, religious frontiers. 
her choice of the absolute and her attachment to the real. The discernment of the real and the concentration on this real is twofold. So Philippine is a good model for us today, for us in ourselves, for us as Sacred Heart educators, to invite our students to choose what is real. Because the world today offers us a lot that is not real, that is not permanent. So, little move now. The discernment between the real and the illusion and a unifying permanent concentration on the real is what the philosophers would call perennial religion. How do we understand that? This is how it is understood. At the heart of every religion lies a set of doctrines, of guidelines, concerning the nature of reality and a method of being able to attain what is real. So every religion, every tradition has its core beliefs, has its doctrines, has its guidelines, giving us a reality, a method of how to attain the real. And what is this real in diversity? It is a unity that underlies that diversity. We can all be different because at the core we are one. Philippine, who was so close to the one, could see that one resides within the heart of all. The search of this truth was in Philippine's heart, gave her a confidence and eagerness to go, to move out, to risk, to cross religious frontiers. This was her principle. What about her perspectives? The call to cross religious frontiers for Philippine meant more than some kind of well-meaning superficial tolerance or an invitation to spiritual tourism. For her, it was a call that she had heard deep in her heart. That was attentive, she was attentive to this in ordinary conversations and that she did not stop asking for it. One day, when Abbot Lestrange dropped in on the community and told them about the Mississippi missions, Philippine was so entranced that she was all for starting off at once and wrote to Philippine, whose reply was, I cannot send you now. But keep up your hope. Work to be worthy. Pray to be chosen. This could have dampened Philippines' hope and eagerness. But she knew that there was an underlying reality which united all people, that there was a wisdom that needed to be grasped beyond her own surroundings. She knew that. And so, if earlier we spoke about perennial religions, now we can talk about perennial wisdom. And what is that? The underlying reality is what is termed as perennial wisdom. What is that, that unity that holds us all together? Wisdom that resides, that resides at the heart of all traditions. Philippine engaged with this kind of wisdom and recognized this value that it held for her and her companions. This eternal wisdom, she knew, was wisdom of the eternal, the wisdom of God. And so what was Philippines' perspective? This is what it was. To love God, to know God, and to know everything is from God. And it is this strength that overcomes all impediments. Sophie knew this about Philippine. So when she arrived in the new world, in her missionary world, 
Sophie writes to Philippine and says, I did not need your letter to be convinced that your high vocation is from God. The persistency of your desires, the ease with which the plan, apparently so beset with difficulties, was carried out when God's time had come. And then she goes on to say, the strength that God gave you will overcome all obstacles. Our Lord has called you. Coming back to our present moment of crossing religious frontiers and looking at the perspectives, it's important to know that an engagement with the perennial wisdom in no way requires us, no way required Philippine to know anything beyond her own religion. And she didn't think that way. Nor does it require us to realize that the knowledge of our own religion makes us know the knowledge of the others. It's not a given. I, can you get this? Philippine only knew her desire to go to the new world. And in her mind, she went to teach the infidels and the savages. But we'll see how this has moved. And in her letter to um, a friend, she writes, for a long time, a very strong and definite attraction has drawn me to the teaching of the infidels. I even thought of going to China, but that is not practicable, as women cannot appear in public there. It would be different today with our five Chinese RSCG. God has listened to my prayers. In Paris, I met the bishop of Louisiana, and it is in his diocese that I shall instruct the savages and found a house of the society. Philippine traveled the path to the summit of her own religion without being granted information about the paths which constituted other religions, not at her time. Certainly not yet, not yet those she was waiting to go to. The perspective of her own beliefs was all that she had. But the fact that she desired, so desired to go beyond her own borders speaks of her readiness to let her perspectives be changed. And this is the challenge of crossing frontiers. And this is what I would say a first merit. The first merit of crossing religious frontiers is the risk, the openness, the courage to put aside my perspectives and let them be changed. The second merit of engaging in this kind of perennial religions and perennial wisdom arises from the therapeutic effect that an encounter with truth as expressed in another tradition can have upon one's own understanding of the truth. The recognition of truth in a foreign religion can awaken and revivify the dormant understanding of an element in one's own religion. Which is, which is that more effective in terms of one's own journey. The most, appropriate, the most appropriate symbol of Philippines' journey into the truth of another people, perhaps, could be seen when she and her companions reached the point where the waters of the Mississippi mingled with those of the sea, forming a distinctly different color. I don't know if I can get this working, but we'll try. That's all, cannot go further. Their journey was marked with things and events that took them by surprise. 
the view, the rocks, the night fire. Brighter, she says, the night fireflies glow brighter than the ones in France. Hmm? Things are changing. <coughs> the crocodiles, the passengers, and even renewing their vows on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. Finally, it was with deepest emotion that I set foot on this soil, which for us, in the eyes of faith and the designs of God, is the promised land. With a heart filled of gratitude, in spite of the marshy ground, Philippine knelt and kissed the very soil, the soil she was yet to know. And then her encounters began. In all her encounters, she was aware that everyone was hospitable, charitable, kind, and so on. And in a letter to Sophie, she says, I have never met more manner and charm than these Creoles possess. The more the encounter with the people around her grew, the more Philippine learned of the truth in them and she had the courage to share her own. She says, the Creoles who are in the majority in New Orleans are softer, lighter, and more pleasure loving. They marry at 12 or 15 and consider 16 too late. One of them, after taking music for a month, was able to compose. They are like those trees that grow quickly and die early, but their appearance is charming in every detail. What happened to the savages and infidels that she spoke of earlier? One does not come across these expressions in Philippines' life anymore. She loved the children who loved their own reality. And she writes now to, Phil to Sophie and she says, if our sisters in France imagine us surrounded by savages, they are quite mistaken. She allowed, through her encounters, her perspectives to be changed. And the third and most important merit of perennial wisdom, and one that has great urgency, great urgency in today's world and age is the meeting of religions, is that we may recognize the truth in different forms. That is to say, we may recognize God in our neighbor's belief, tradition, or religion. In the situation where Philippine found herself, there was no dearth of opportunity to recognize this truth in different forms. She had the zeal, she gained the knowledge of the traditions that people, to the people she met. She discovered, in doing this, she discovered a new and a meaning of the interior life. She helped people under her care to form themselves in the love and knowledge of the Lord, in a manner not merely of concepts, but also effective. There is often a risk at the frontier, at the frontier and in crossing it. It can feel the furthest, the longest, and the hardest journey to undertake. But such a journey is worth taking in view of the freedom, the imagination, and the creativity it implies. This was really the truth in a very different form. And she says this to Sophie. People sometimes set fire to the woods and to wide, prairie, wide prairies where the tall grass is very dry, very different from where she's coming from. In the autumn, we saw fires on all sides, and in the woods opposite us, on the other side of Missouri. In crossing frontiers, in crossing religious frontiers, Philippine preserved the religious truth of her own tradition. This gave her the zeal to gain knowledge of the tradition of the people she met. In doing so, she discovered anew the meaning of the interior life. She helped people placed under her care to form themselves. Somebody said this morning, to empower. She empowered people to their own, to understand their own love and their knowledge of the Lord. There is a risk in being at the frontier and crossing it. Frontier crossing is not an external event, but a deep spiritual experience. 
an experience of separation, an experience of stretching, stretching beyond our comfort zones and preconceptions. When I hear the word frontiers, I don't think of tourists, but of pioneers. Even today, I think of vision, courage, perseverance, endurance, even adventure. A sense of loss at what has been left behind and yet deeply present. Shaping the innermost self and identity. All with the breath of God, the compassionate breath of God. And so what have we seen so far? Philippines defining moment. What were her principles? What were her perspectives? What were her encounters? And what was her spiritual experience? And to end this first part of my keynote address, I'll end it with this. Only breath. Not Christian or Jew or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi or Zen, not any religion or cultural system. I am not from the East or the West, not out of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or ethereal, not composed of elements at all. I do not exist. Am not an entity in this world or the next. Did not descend from Adam and Eve or any origin story. My place is the placeless, a trace of the traceless, neither body or soul. I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one, and that one call to and know. First, last, outer, inner, only that breath, breathing, human, being. I belong to the beloved have seen the two worlds as one and that one call to and know first, last, outer, 
inner. Only that breath breathing human being. So I'll give you about two minutes now, just to stop. What are your, some of your feelings now? What is the defining moment in your life? And where is that leading you? What is Philippine awakening in you so that you would be able to cross religious frontiers? And what is the one thing you wish to change that will enable you to cross those frontiers? So I'll give you just two minutes to, to stop and think about this. And you can share with your partner one word that comes to you now. Just one word, just with your partner on either side. One word to yourselves, among yourselves. some laughter. <laughs> for the streaming live stream. <laughs> so you can keep your, your words, your thoughts, because you will have time to talk about it and to share it with, your, with each other and with your students. I go now to the second part of my address, discovering a new the interior life. And this is what we will do. We will look at it in three points. Stations of the heart, the soul's journey, and the challenge. When we address the question of identities and frontier crossing as a religious phenomenon, we are not just talking about Philippine crossing frontiers. We are saying Philippine crossing religious frontiers. The difference in attitudes to the frontiers 
in the various religious traditions have consequences when it comes to dialogue among followers of these traditions. And we don't think of this. We say Christianity is bad, Islam is bad, or Hinduism, whatever. But it's not that religions are bad, it's the followers. Who makes the religion? It's dialogue between Muslims and Christians, between Christians and Hindus, between uh, Buddhists and Christians, or whatever. Yeah? It's not dialogue among the religions, it's dialogue among the followers of these religions. The redeeming element or the way to engage in this dialogue is through the experience of mysticism. And we don't have time, but I have many success stories of meeting people at the depth when it comes to mysticism. There is no one bad. There is no terrorist. The mystic is able to move and commune invisibly across the frontiers. It's like an ocean where all the rivers meet. Returning to Philippines' defining moment, she says, then I took possession of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, holding him close to my heart. To discover the interior life is to hold God close to our heart and is to take that God to the people we meet. And in doing that, we also hold the other close to our heart, despite our limitations. And according to a Sufi mystic, Al-Tirmidhi, the heart is referring to a place in the body as having four stations. The breast, the outermost, where it is a light of practice, where people practice, where people are searching. It's a knowledge of right action and tyrannical. This is the outermost. The second level is the heart, the light of faith, believer, and inner knowledge, and regretful. The person knows I have made a mistake. Uh -huh. I have done wrong. Or I shouldn't have said this, or shouldn't have said that, whatever. The inner heart is the light of gnosis, of knowledge, <laughs> inner vision, and being inspired. And there is the innermost heart, which is the lights, which is union, which is uniqueness, unified, <laughs> divine grace, and serene. So these are the stations of the heart. People move from the outermost <coughs> to the innermost. Philippines' soul journey would be very much this. She knew that the intellect was of two kinds. And the intellect is of two kinds. One is the acquired intellect, where we get information from outside, from books, from teachers, from reflection, from rote, from concepts. And the second is received from inside. And that is what we would, we would term as the complete intellect. So Philippine moved from being a seeker to being a believer to knowing or having a knowledge and then being in union with God. And so it moved. This was her journey. <coughs> All this could happen because she was with Jesus at all times. And in silence, he molded <coughs> her into his own shape. There were some things in life that she loved, and her love put forth what was important to her, like the society and Sophie. But 
she refused and offered to go home and see her. She loved her family but wanted them all to be mission minded. We are dealing with a very strong person here. She loved her sisters but she drove them mad or hard. She followed those from Florison who did wonders for her Indians. She loved the church, but despite all this, she longed to go to heaven. She longed for heaven. This was a very important part of, of Philippines' life. Nothing of this could satisfy her soul. She craved solitude and the interior life. In 1840, to her deepest joy, she was relieved of all authority and left alone with God. At this time, she was 71 and had 12 years to live. Whether she had 12 years to live or had lived 36 years already in America, Philippines suffered practically every hardship a frontier had to offer. Poor lodging, shortage of food, drinking water, fuel, money, high postal rates, forest fires and blazing chimneys, climate, cramped living quarters and the provision of all privacy, the crude manners of children, the school children's ingratitude towards the nuns who tried to teach them, and so on. Loneliness of, a rem of remote places and a foreign tongue. Criticism of people who should have appreciated her work. But she also knew that she had spiritual abundance. Perhaps this sprang from her own prayer. In her first letter in 1824, she writes about her retreat with, with Father, Father Van Quickenborn. And she says those eight days were really a time of spiritual abundance. For February 1823, she had only one single entry in her journal where she shared a sad story. The withdrawal and complaints of two postulants who had no vocation. The worldliness of her pupils who have left school and their forgetfulness of her. The indocility of the present pupils. All this makes her feel the weight of the cross. And to do it, and to it must be added poverty and an illness that has attacked nearly all religious and a number of the children. She was learning the doctrine of the cross from within her own heart. For Philippine, the Indians, they appreciated her from the moment she set foot in Sugar Creek. They loved her and respected her and brought her all kinds of things like fresh corn and newly laid eggs, chickens, wild plums, sweet, clean straw for her palate. You see the love that the children had for her. But one thing was noticed, that she was but one, 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 of the, one of our sisters wrote about her and this is what she said. The Indians had the greatest admiration for her, recommended themselves to her prayers and called her a woman who prays always. Because her story is, she stayed all morning in the church, so Sister Louise would take her a cup of coffee each day and she drank it at the door of the church. After dinner, she went in again for three or four hours of prayer the Indians had great admiration for her. So we see the, maybe you can have this paper of mine because there's a lot that I've written there about how Philippine has moved from this soul journey of discovering the interior, of discovering that interior life. And a very important thing for us to, to know is how she moved from her nothingness, not from her fullness. We'll see that in a minute. Process of regeneration or enlightenment or the discovery of the interior life can happen with a companion with who you have a sense of belonging. And who was Philippines' companion? Sophie. 
Philippine had a depth of affection for Sophie and the bond of intimate friendship drew these two gifted women together. In her first letter, Sophie writes to Philippine, she invites her to enter more and more fully into the designs of the loving Lord. I do not belong to myself, but to you. Philippine writes to, to Sophie. Uh, Sophie writes to Philippine. Read that sentence again if you like. I do not belong to myself, but to you. In the same letter, Sophie reminds Philippine to embrace the cross. Often in her correspondence, Sophie asks Philippine to wait, to act with prudence, to take care of her health, and commends her for her commitment and the details of her letters that delights her and inflames her zeal. And Sophie's letters to Philippine makes her aware of what crossing frontiers entails. She says, my dear daughter, do not think of retirement. I have not yet anyone to replace you. Being away from home, Sophie shares with Philippine her concerns, the reality of the society, and of course, her love for her. The wisdom of Sophie drawn from the heart of Christ showed Philippine the way, gave her the method to cross frontiers and know the heart of her God. Thus making her failure not the opposite of success, but part of success. So even though Philippine felt that she was a failure, it really, it was her success. Philippine let Jesus point the way, wisdom. And she discovered him anew as she followed him in her hearts, in the hearts of all the people she met. She let the interior life capture her as she waited upon the Lord by day and by night. And towards the end of her life, Philippines summed up her spiritual journey in the four stations of a Sufi. And she says, oh my God, I desire to live as a victim offered in a spirit of penance and love. Then let me prepare all that is needed for a sacrifice of love whose perfume will rise even to the heart of Jesus. Journeying to the frontiers took Philippine to her innermost heart. Not from the pole of being, but from the pole of nothingness. From her nothingness. One needs to learn that to cross frontiers both from the pole of being or fullness or from the pole of nothingness. So it's the pole of fullness or the or, the, or let's say the point of departure of fullness or of nothingness. In Hinduism, it's the fullness is called Puranam and Shunyata is called nothingness. Using either or is a danger. We have to use both. The inability to cross over to the different from either pole can severely handicap the enterprise and weaken our understanding of the world the ultimate and the self. The Christian attempts to cross over to the other, to the different, by and large from the pole of being full, of fullness, but this creates problems. Philippine, without really knowing it, activated the ability to cross over from the pole of nothingness or emptiness. She lived the Christian mystery from her heart, the mystery of Jesus Christ, who offers the revelation of both fullness and nothingness together. The total self-emptying. Many frontiers which are found to be difficult to negotiate and cross could be crossed by making other people or the other pole represented in the Christian mystery of emptiness. Perhaps here lies something that could become an important program for followers of all religions and traditions in our world today. From where do I respond to the other. On her deathbed, from her nothingness, she gave her all. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Her answer, I give you my heart, my soul, and my life. Oh yes, my life generously. 
18th, November 1852 at the Angelus Mary's Fair, at the Angelus remembering Mary and birthing of a holy mystery into the world, Philippines' life on earth came to an end. To a beginning of life, to a deeper and newer discovery and mystery of the interior life. The pioneer spirit lives on in her sisters, her friends, in each of you. In the United States of America, in South America, through the blessing she gave Anna de Roussier, in her journey to a foundation in Timor, New Zealand, a journey by sea that sailed further west, the society reached the Far East. 1988, Philippine canonized a saint. The pattern of Philippines' life lives on waiting, falling, moving on, discovering the wound where the light enters, and moving the world with love. And the story is not over. We are facing a global problem. The question today is the question of frontiers and with other religious traditions. The question is not going to be resolved by choosing between inclusivism and pluralism. It calls for something more. A global problem requires a global solution, a global responsibility. We can learn from Philippine how to develop the spiritual agility and wisdom to deal with frontiers and boundaries. And it's an attitude of open integrity. The experiential and open-ended character inherent in every frontier crossing and encounter will lead us. The aim is not to change one's belief, but to make space for the other's deeply held belief. Once this space for another's belief is created, the dignity of difference can flourish. And so it may look something like this. Perennial religion, methods to obtain the real. To truly open ourselves to others. To a perennial wisdom, the essence of unity and each religion is the intervention of God. So here is perennial religion, methods to obtain what is real, where we open ourselves to others. Here, when you go deeper, you see the wisdom, the essence of unity, and you open yourself, we open ourselves to God. The essence of God, of religion, where we meet God. So you go down, you open yourself to God, and that truth, that essence will make us available and make us understand the truth of the other. A relationship that moves out with a deeper understanding of each other's religion. And for many of you here who have heard me before, maybe you will remember this diagram. But this is one of my favorite diagrams. I love this. And you can see here, if you want to represent the world, if you want to represent the world, this is how it may look. And each one is in our own tradition, own belief, own truth, all walking around the world. And we are all walking around with our own truth, but we are far from each other. And we are far from God. We are all looking at each other, we are looking at ourselves from the external. And when we go, the closer we are to the truth, to the heart of our own religion, the closer we are to each other. Yeah. And that's what I would say we are called to today. To, to be brave, to know our own truth, to be open, to know the truth of the other, and to go deep in that, each one, each one of us is knowing our own truth, going closer to God, we are closer to each other. 
and in that truth we all meet in that religion of the heart this is what would define us now as rscj or as partners or as schools or whatever you want core of rscj education this is what it would be the religion of the heart and before i give you my second set of questions i just want to end my address with a story the master loved one of his disciples very much but this caused some jealousy of course one day the master who could see the frontiers in the distance called her disciples and said to them i see frontiers in the distance and i invite each of you to go there cross all borders to reach there take all risks that is required and reach there and once you are there write your story in a place where no one could see you no one at all soon i will be with you to listen to your story when the master met her disciples they came one by one each one with their story finally the favorite disciple came with a blank paper the others laughed and whispered among themselves that the favorite disciple had finally proved how foolish she was she could not even carry out the ideas that were so simple given by the master so the master asked each one how they carried out their instructions and to read out their story the first one said i got my paper my best pens and colored pencils went into a small house locked the door closed the door closed all the curtains and wrote my story the other one said i went to the place which was allotted to us for our stay locked the door entered a closet with light just enough for me to see my pen and i wrote my story the third disciple also said i took enough paper and enough ink in my pen and even blindfolded myself so that i even i could not see myself writing my own story and the description continued one went into a cave one went into a forest a deserted place and so on last was the turn of the favorite disciple she hung her head embarrassed feeling a failure with her paper blank in her hand in a low voice she said i got my paper and pen into my room to write my story as you invited us to but everywhere you were there there was a presence i went into the innermost parts of the forest but the presence was with me i went into the darkest caves the presence was there there was no place i could go where i was not seen the favorite disciple crossed frontiers and discovered what was in her innermost heart the presence then the other disciples realized why she was the master's favorite disciple and philippine takes us to that presence <coughs> these are your questions for your second part of your reflection describe your soul journey at which station is it now in this moment of your life philippine's prayer was for the people she loved and for the people she had never even met for whom is your prayer how can you make philippine spirit alive in your own life so that so that our world today can receive her spirit what is the one thing you would like to take home with you from this morning thank you
Well, I don't know about you, but there was so much in that presentation from Juliet that it just does take some time to synthesise everything she said. But let's thank her very much for such a fantastic, <laughs> wonderful address. I, I thought, Juliet, when you started and you said to Kristen that what you hoped you were was bringing peace to others, but first having peace within yourself. I thought that was an interesting concept, but you developed that completely in that first section when you looked at crossing frontiers, religious frontiers. And, and I think that what I took from it was the experience of uh, actually being open to listening and understanding other people's faith. And by doing so, you learn more about your own faith and more certainty about your own faith. And then you challenged us with those questions in particular. Um, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> about uh, what is Philippine awakening in you so that you were able to cross religious frontiers. I, I think that um, it would be interesting to hear other people's views, but for me, when, when you pose that question, I think that you first of all have to perhaps undo all the prejudices that you may have built up through a lack of knowledge and leave yourself open mm -hmm. to be able to absorb um, what is the truth and understand your own faith a lot better. Um, but I'd be interested in other people to make comment about that and what you reflected on. If you, if you could take a moment if anybody would like to share their thoughts. It's a challenge.
and, and what you said about Philippine learning the truth in the Potawatomi people, that she had the courage to then share her own truths yeah. with them. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that first section of Jaredette's presentation? And then moving into the second um, part of your presentation, discovering the interior life, and that sort of wonderful analogy of it being in four parts, first as seekers, then of believers, and then of being inspired, and finally being in union, um, and that f those four elements and where we're at in our particular journey you ask us. Would anybody like to share their thoughts? Yes. Yes, so you're closer to the divine and therefore you are closer to others through their closeness to their divine, to the one divine. <laughs> I was um, thinking when you said that in 1840 she was left alone and you know, that other duties were taken off her. So she really had time to make sure she um, reached that fourth stage of um, unity. And in a way she gained heaven here on earth. Um, there's a lovely song, um, Heaven on Earth, Tracy J uh, Chapman, if you know it. <laughs> No, 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 I can't <laughs> sing. <laughs> Are there any thought, other thoughts? Yes, so it's not just in one direction, it's also an, uh, it's circular. Mm. Yes. She experienced his 
fidelity to her. I think that's really true, it's very beautiful, and I think it's why she's so esteemed. You know, as you know, the Potawatomi showed up for the canonization. Mm -hmm. Now picture, she's only there one year. If you go there and you mention you're connected to her, today Potawatomi will hold you in reverence. That's, mm -hmm. that's amazing to me, that kind of quality of relation, relating. Mm -hmm. But it was following Jesus in her story. That's, that's mm -hmm. it. So thank you for that. It's very helpful. Are there any other comments? She was drawing to people who loved her. They saw her out to sit on the porch, to sit on the delivery. So in all of that sort of stuff, the way she got to live with her life, whatever she was doing, chronologically through her life, her spirituality was palpable to those around her. And that she drew more and more people. Um, and they, they, even if they didn't have strong faith themselves, they were keen to teach the stronger faith that was going to understand them. And it was obviously her example rather than her words that made the big difference. Mm. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> In one sense, um, what Philippine was able to do was to detect in the potomotomy the depth of their own spiritual life. And she communicated that in reflecting it through her prayer, their depth of the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And so it was a mutual encounter, a unit of encounter mm -hmm. of these two spiritualities. Mm -hmm. And when I was at uh, Shoe Creek, you could palpably feel within the environment of Zakata and the wind and whatnot that, that the, the spiritual life was palpable there. Mm -hmm. For West Philippine and for the bottom of mm. mm. I think that leads into what you were saying about mm. the dignity of the saints, mm. right? It must have been quite unique for the Potawatomi to have all the atrocities that they experienced to have this woman convey in that community to like, mm. convey them the dignity of their spirituality mm. and to, yeah, I guess, yeah, show some reverence in that. It must have been unique for them to tell her why they held her in such mm. reverence. But she did that by being. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That would be wonderful in Ireland, wouldn't it, Bernadette? Oh, Yvonne, anybody else? Well, oh, dear, dear, thank you again. What a wonderful presentation. And g you've given us so much to think about and contemplate on over the next few days. Thank you. <laughs>